the guy that plays the guitar on Sunshine of Your Love, among other, you know, great. Well, the blind stuff. faith guy. Or the blind faith guy. Hey, are you going to do a video on blind faith? Hi, I'm Abby. I have a lot of records, and this is Vinyl Monday. So welcome back, or welcome if this is your first time here. Vinyl Monday is the series where once a week I sit down and just talk about classic albums that I love. If 20 minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds, both here on my channel and over on my Instagram. A quick announcement before we get this week's episode rolling. The guys of the Losing My Opinion podcast were kind enough to have me on their latest episode. We talked a little bit about The Doors, of course, my favorite five boys from Detroit, uh, some about how I got into psych rock, and a little on this week's album. So if you caught that when I announced it on my Instagram, I announced everything first over there, then you already knew what this week's album was. Thank you so much to Niagara Moon and Thin Lear for having me on. It was great to be a part of your podcast. And you can listen in the link in my description. If you did already listen to that episode by chance, then you knew what this week's album was. Blind Faith. Oh boy. To the rest of you, congrats to those who guessed this one. Remember, if you want to play along with my little game of what album I'm going to cover next, all you got to do is check out my community tab. I post my fun little behind the scenes stuff over there, sometimes a poll, and the hints. All right, let's take the plastic off. So my copy, well, this is actually one of my four copies of Blind Faith. This is the album that I have the most copies of. Uh, this is copy number two. It's a repress from 1969. It's kind of my beater copy that I've thrown onto my turntable and played the most. Uh, copy number one is an Italian run from the 80s. Pretty sure there's a vinyl rip of that on YouTube now. It sounds pretty good. Copy three is a US repress from 78. And copy number four was a gift from the patron saint of this channel, Dan. Uh, if you want to hear the Dan story in full, you can watch either my Layla video or my Almost Famous video. I tell it in both of those. So of course this begs the question, why do I have four copies of Blind Faith and I'm only showing you two of them? Well, we really are being thrown right into the deep end with this episode, aren't we? Let's talk about the original Blind Faith cover art. So I can't show you the full original Blind Faith art on YouTube. This actually wasn't the original art. This is the back cover. So the original was photographed by Bob Seedeman, a friend of Clapton's. Uh, if I were to move this jacket, this girl would be topless. And yes, I do mean girl. This girl was 11 or 12 at the time, sources differ. Uh, she definitely wasn't 14. That was her older sister who was scouted as the original model for this art. She was scouted in the London underground to pose for this art, but Seedeman thought she was too old for the effect he wanted. As he stated, if she were too old, it would be cheesecake, meaning your run-of-the-mill pinup photo. And too young, it'd mean nothing. So the sister was brought in, and according to Storm Thorgerson's book, she was bribed with promise of a pony. Uh, she didn't get the pony, she got about $1,000 in today's money instead. Uh, and if all of this makes you queasy, don't worry, you are in the majority. This cover caused an outrage in the States, and rightfully so. For a while, we had the back cover replacing the front cover, and then the inner sheet with the lyrics was bumped to the back. How the label ever okayed that cover, I will never understand. These were the days when Come Together by the Beatles was being banned from radio play, for a little context. I can't help but think this gets even weirder when you take into consideration Clapton's fixation on blondes. We can't forget he caused the most famous love triangle in rock and roll history by going for his best friend's wife, 
Patty Boyd, but when he can't have her, he gets with her sister Paula, who was 16 at the time, until him and Patty get together for real. But that's a story for another video. What I haven't told you is that it seems Clapton's blonde streak started with Charlotte Martin. Uh, they dated in the cream days until she would run off with a certain Yardbird. That's right, Jimmy Page, Eric Clapton, Eric Clapton. He is to blame for like four years of rock and roll mess. Jokes aside, I don't know. This original cover seems like a visual representation of how widespread and accepted abuse was in rock and roll. Art is art, but come on. Could this cover not have been done with a woman? It would have been so sick and really sexy with a grown woman. What's wrong with it being like a pinup, right? But instead, it's just weird. Uh, I can't help but wonder where the parents were. All of this is super disappointing. Anyway, the art piece was called Blind Faith. The band was unnamed until they were presented the art, uh, and they just decided to name their band and their album after the art. The cover we see here was adapted from a flyer for Blind Faith's Hyde Park performance in June of 69. Here we have the Blind Faith lineup, Steve Winwood on vocals, keys, organ, harmonica, and the auto harp on Sea of Joy. Eric Clapton on guitar and vocals. Ginger Baker on drums. And Rick Gretsch on bass and violin. We have arrangement by Robert Stigwood and Chris Blackwell. In reality, they were the executive producers funding the project. Engineers include Andy Johns and Keith Harwood, and this record was produced by Jimmy Miller. Roll transition. <laughs> the brief but eventful history of Blind Faith begins with Eric Clapton, first of the Yardbirds, then John Mayall's Blues Breakers, and then his own group, Cream. The group breaks up, or rather, implodes spectacularly around the end of 68. Bassist slash vocalist Jack Bruce and drummer Ginger Baker could push each other's buttons like no one else. They got in fights pretty often, leaving Eric to play Peacemaker. And I'm not talking like petty Beatles breakup fighting. No, I'm talking Jack and Ginger beating the shit out of each other more than once. This is literally the only Clapton band dynamic I can think of where he wasn't the problem, and one of the few instances I feel bad for this guy. Anyway, Cream breaks up after playing a farewell show at Royal Albert Hall. Now we come upon Steve Winwood, first of the Spencer Davis group, and then Traffic. And now these two, Eric and Steve, had known of each other for a while. The thing about the British blues bands in the 60s is that they all knew each other, or at least knew of each other. They were both teen prodigies playing in the Yardbirds and Spencer Davis, respectively, but they didn't meet until 68 when Steve Winwood was asked to join Cream. The two bond over being in groups rife with drama. There was a lot of infighting towards the end of Spencer Davis, and after Cream finally breaks up, Eric and Steve jam together and find that they're really vibing. The one problem is they need a drummer. Enter absolute madman Ginger Baker. Now let me be clear, Clapton did not want Ginger anywhere near this group. He didn't want Blind Faith to be thought of as just a Cream spinoff. He wanted it to have the chance to be its own thing. Ginger was hot-headed, a loose cannon, if you will, so much that when he showed up to a jam session, Clapton had a panic attack. Again, one of the rare moments in which I feel bad for him. The thing is, there's not a lot of drummers to begin with, and there's very few better, and with a more open schedule, now that Cream is broken up, than Ginger Baker. So, he is reluctantly led into the group. Rounding out the Blind Faith lineup is Rick Gretsch of Family. This is by far the least known group of the bunch. Uh, family has been lost to the sands of time, similar to how Gypsy 
blue cheer and love all were for a long time. I really like observations from a hill and second generation woman from their record Family Entertainment. That record kind of reminds me of the Bee Gees Odessa in the way that it's similarly scatterbrained psych pop goodness. After jamming through January, material is workshopped at Morgan Studios through February and March of 69. Production moved so fast because once Clapton had another group formed, the label basically went, oh, another group, you say? We would like some of your money, I mean your music. How about you make an album, huh? Work moves to Olympic Studios in April and May, and all of production is wrapped up by June, so Blind Faith can go on tour with Free and Delaney and Bonnie and Friends. This tour becomes very important later. Blind Faith didn't have much material at all, with two 10-plus minute jams, a cover, and a handful of other songs, but it was all put on this album. The track listing of Blind Faith goes as follows. Opening up side one, we have one of our jams, Had to Cry Today, followed by Can't Find My Way Home. Then, Well All Right, a Buddy Holly cover, and side one is rounded out with Presence of the Lord. This was the first song that Eric Clapton had ever written. Opening up side two, we have Sea of Joy, and closing out side two, we have our second jam, the 15 minute long Do What You Like. After releasing their self-titled record in August of 69, Blind Faith is considered the first supergroup. And yeah, this band does not last long at all. They didn't even last the year. As soon as Ginger was on board, Clapton wanted this thing over and done with. He had one foot out the door pretty much the whole time, which explains why this album was thrown together in four months and the band was pretty much broken up by the time it was out. Of their very short history is a kick-ass show at Hyde Park. They did this cover of Under My Thumb by The Stones and I love it. It brings out all the insidious undertones of the original and makes them overtones. It's menacing, it rocks. And did I mention this show at Hyde Park was their very first show ever as a group? Apparently the guys weren't satisfied with it, they felt they weren't rehearsed enough, but I don't think that matters when you have these four all in a group. Now about that tour with Delaney and Bonnie. Clapton really bonded with these guys and started jamming with them more and more, half out of genuine admiration and half out of the need to get the hell and fuck out of Blind Faith. If it weren't for the Blind Faith tour with Delaney and Bonnie, Clapton wouldn't have started playing with them for real. Uh, Delaney and Bonnie is pretty much what he filled all of his rest of 1969 and winter of 1970 with. He wouldn't have invited his best friend George Harrison to also play with Delaney and Bonnie as the Beatles are on the outs, and if he hadn't met Bobby Whitlock, Carl Radle, and Jim Gordon through that group, we wouldn't have the lineup for All Things Must Pass. And if it wasn't for All Things Must Pass, we would not have Derek and the Dominoes. It's all connected, people! So as unfortunate as it is that we didn't get another stab at a Blind Faith album, this thing is only like six songs, right? If that group hadn't folded, we never would have gotten Clapton's best body of work. Guess I gotta thank Blind Faith breaking up for that, at least. So you know what I think about Blind Faith, the art? <laughs> so, what do I think of Blind Faith, the album? Going in, I remember loving this record. This used to be my go-to Clapton release for just throwing on the turntable and playing the whole way through. You can't really do that with a double album like Layla, right? Uh, it's short and sweet as far as blues jam records go. Quantity over quality. No, wait, f quantity over quality. The horrible album art fried my brain. But after my first listen back for this video, after a long time of not picking it up, I had but one thought. Yeah. 
What the f did I just listen to? I won't lie to you guys, this is a weird one, especially for what we think of when we think Clapton. It's bluesier than Traffic, but less blues rooted than Cream. And listen, this record is not going to be for everyone. For one, it has all of the meandering long jams of a blues record, just like I said with Layla, you have to pack your patience with blind faith. And it's obvious that this thing was slammed together in a matter of months. Uh, there's meandering, like I said, and there's fat that could have been trimmed off. Had to cry today is the best example of the fat not being trimmed off of this record. Uh, it gives it this weird appeal. First, I think, okay, this song is way too repetitive, could have been two to three minutes shorter. It repeats itself a lot. But then it switches up at seven minutes in. You get that tape loop or backtracking effect, and Rick takes that main motif while you get two guitar solos on top. I'm sorry, I know it's cheap, but I'm a sucker for that move. Then I don't want it to be over, and then it's just done. So what else happened to me through that first listen back with Blind Faith? I had the epiphany that, oh my god, Blind Faith is structured like a jazz album. Is Blind Faith a jazz album? But hear me out! I took a look at this record sequencing. You have the jams bookending the album at the beginning of side A and the end of side B, as opposed to starting off both the A and the B side. It also lies in how the songs on this album are structured. Listen to something like So What or A Night in Tunisia or All of a Love Supreme and you'll find that the Blind Faith material is structured the same way. It's so cool. The best example of Blind Faith kinda sorta maybe being a jazz album has to be Do What You Like. Now the last time I was pouring over Blind Faith I would have been 21 or 22, I hadn't heard much jazz music at all. It'd take me discovering a certain five boys from Detroit and their love of Coltrane, Charlie Parker, and Sun Ra for me to really discover jazz. I knew the jazz connection went deeper than those chants, you know, do what you like, do what you like. They're used the same way a Love Supreme uses them. Through that first WTF listen, that's what I'm calling it forever now, I realized, oh my god, Do What You Like is in 5-4 time. Dave Brubeck has entered the chat! I won't get too specific with my breakdown of Do What You Like structure, I already did that on Losing My Opinion, but I do want to point out how those solos are treated. After each solo, the instrument pretty much drops out. The one exception is Steve. He has some chords dispersed here and there, but they're so low in the mix you can barely hear them. Starts with Steve's solo, then Eric, then Rick, and finally Ginger. On a song like Do What You Like, I imagine you don't want to be the guy stuck with the first solo. You want to play as long as possible to really show off your musical chops. Or maybe Steve wanted to just put his feet up in the studio that day, I don't know. So who wrote the most jazz number on Blind Faith? It's gotta be the guy who wanted Sunshine of Your Love in 16-8 time. Who but Ginger Baker. He pushes the time signature and the tempo throughout his solo, sort of molding the song into whatever he wishes it to be. One of my favorite jazz records is Dizzy Gillespie's Afro, and I thought of the song Caravan while listening to Do What You Like. From how Ginger drums, especially on Do What You Like, you can tell he liked Afro and all of the African music that inspired it. Ugh, yeah, it is so hard to call an MVP of Blind Faith. I went back and forth for ages on Rick, Steve, and Ginger. Uh, but I'm gonna hand it to Ginger for this one. Of course I'm gonna spotlight Clapton, can't forget about him. I'm gonna spotlight Presence of the Lord. It's a really interesting solo, unlike anything he'd ever played before or since. Well, almost. His guitar tone on Presence got me thinking, huh, 
I've heard this somewhere before. I heard it on a Derek and the Dominoes outtake circa 1971 called Devil Road. Devil Road was a product of sessions for the ill-fated second Domino's record. Now this is very controversial because no one can seem to decide if it's actually clapped and playing on this thing or not, let alone if it's a legit Domino's song. You have to remember Clapton was in a really bad way in 71. He wasn't exactly in the shape to be playing much. Setting aside my ex's correspondence with the singer on that track, Renee Armand, she says this song is real. I believe the presence of the Lord solo is irrefutable proof that yes, Clapton is playing on Devil Road. There's a very similar tone on both songs, indicative of them both being played on the same instrument. Through the solo, he's either playing his telly or his firebird. It's hard to tell. I'm inclined to believe it's the firebird. And the phrasing is the same, but slightly different, indicative of Eric's evolution through playing with the dominoes. You hear dominoes live recordings from 71, and it sounds like Devil Road. This is a style he wouldn't play in ever again. And if you listen to Presence of the Lord, it sounds the most like a Derek and the Dominoes era solo. All right, conspiracy theory time over. Presence of the Lord as a song, you have to have your patience with. It starts as one thing and it evolves into something totally different. Steve Winwood really was a perfect choice in vocalist for Blind Faith. The way his voice can ride atop of everything going on underneath. Now it's not quite like Cream, listen to Crossroads and it's basically three soloists all soloing on top of each other. That doesn't happen on Blind Faith. It gets a little muddy sometimes. For some fucking reason, the keys, bass, and drums all smush together like plain applesauce. But Winwood's vocals cut like a knife through all of that. Uh, I love his vocals to begin with, but Can't Find My Way Home and Sea of Joy are career highs. Playing alongside such bigger than big names as two members of Cream and one member of Traffic meant that Rick Gretsch got kind of dwarfed in Blind Faith's legacy. Paul Henderson, writing for Louder, went as far as to call him, and I quote, an economy passenger flying first class. Make no mistake, Rick is an invaluable component to Blind Faith. Case in point, his solo on Do What You Like. From the family tracks I've heard, his playing style is a lot more subtle over in that group than it is on Blind Faith. I love actually being able to hear him here. The violin on Sea of Joy is so unexpected, it's unlike anything else you hear on the album, but it reminds me of one of my favorite Cream tracks, Deserted Cities of the Heart. You know, a lot about Blind Faith reminds me of Wheels of Fire. There's the same sense of urgency, this unstable feeling like the wheels are about to come off at any moment. I share a birthday with this record, by the way. Anyway, Rick was batting a thousand on Blind Faith. Blind Faith is a weird one. Hearing those offbeat song structures and rambling jam tangents, the haste with which this album was thrown together is apparent. Everyone had one foot out the door and you can tell. Despite it being so short, it takes some patience to work through. Definitely an album you have to work for. But once you spend time with it, those disjointed parts and perspectives and influences, they all come together to make this patchwork hidden gem across all of these guys' discographies. Can it be sluggish? Yes. Is Blind Faith a real slugger anyway? Also yes. My personal favorites off this one are Had to Cry Today, Can't Find My Way Home, Well All Right, Presence of the Lord, Sea of Joy, and Do What You Like. Come on, with a record this short, I can't leave any one song out. If you want to keep up with all of my favorites from all of the Vinyl Monday episodes, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. I lost my copy of Jesus.
I need to stop leaving things all over this room. Ah! And if you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday at 11 a.m. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye!